What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the My Other Passion Podcast. I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief of Front Office Sports, and today we have another awesome guest, Vineet Barrara. He's a bit of an iconic investor and entrepreneur. He famously founded Diapers.com with his longtime friend, Mark Laurie. They grew up together in New Jersey, and they sold that company to Amazon for a little over half a million dollars. In general, both of these guys are prolific. They have started and sold a ton of companies. Right now, they're focused on Mojo, which they found it together among some other people and it's essentially a sports stock market and they're really betting that that's going to be the future of how we interact with sports so we talked about mojo we talked about the other companies that he sold and had big exits on we talked about just life and business and everything in between so i'm not going to keep you waiting awesome conversation let's go ahead and get right into it but first a word from our sponsor that's week. The year 2000, 2008, 2022, when it comes to the economy, those are some pretty scary years. You got the dot-com crash, the housing crash, and the roller coaster that we're going through right now. One thing is certain, it is a dangerous time to not know your numbers. But over 31,000 businesses don't have that problem. They have the confidence and clarity they need because they rely on NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. How do you prepare for these uncertain times? easy. NetSuite. It's going to give you the visibility and control over your financials, inventory, HR, planning, and budgeting all in one place, lets you manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and overall just improve your margins. That's because you'll be able to identify rising costs, automate your business processes, and ultimately just see where you can save money. 93% of customers said they improved their visibility and control when they upgraded to NetSuite. So what are you waiting for? Right now, you're in luck because NetSuite is offering a -a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. All you got to do is head over to netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. Go there right now. Go while you're listening to the episode, netsuite.com slash my other passion. I promise it is going to take your business to the next level. Vinny, welcome to the My Other Passion podcast. Really happy to have you here today. Thanks for having me. So how's everything going on your end? Good. It's going great. It's a great day here in New York City. So uh, all's good. All right. Well, uh, definitely a beautiful city. I was telling you before we jumped on, I lived out there for a while. A uh, lot of a lot of stuff to do, a lot of inspiration to be had. Um, so I always just, <laughs> once you move to the West Coast, like me, every time you talk to a New York person, you're like, oh, I miss this. I remember that. But, you know, I'm making the most of, of yeah. LA. You're in uh, Vegas now? I am in Vegas. I had to do some work out here quickly, but yeah. Just, yeah, think, just just, trying to live life. It's a good time in New York. I've, I've been here too long. I think it's almost 30 years now I've lived here. Wow. Okay. So that's early 90s. Early the, city's, 90s. the city's changed a lot. Like what, <laughs> what have you seen happen in those 30 years? Oh, well, I started, I came here for law school in, in 1993. So I was up in, uh, up at Columbia. So um, it has definitely changed, like you said. It's, it's, but I've now, I mean, I grew up in New Jersey, but I consider myself a New Yorker, and it has been um, just an amazing experience. The city has gotten better and better. The last couple of years have been tough, obviously, with COVID, but we're coming out of it now. And it seems like it's got some of that electricity back that we used to have pre-COVID. So um, there's no place I'd rather be. So I'm a a hard New Yorker. I was there maybe a month ago, and the streets are just like on fire. It seems you know everyone's ready to just burst out and and give back to to live in life. So it was pretty cool to see. No, exactly. A lot of people are back, and uh, with this kind of weather today, you know, it's like seventy five degrees and sunny with that full fall brisk. And as a sports fan, you know, we got football season that just started, the Yankees and Mets. So uh, um, it's uh, there's definitely some electricity here. Right. I just I just saw like a TikTok or something and this guy was like, We're set for the next several months. We got basketball, we got football coming, we got the World Cup, we have yeah. like all these things, a bunch of like big movies and video games dropping. It's uh it's it's just a good time. Like I, I'm a fan of of the zeitgeist, you know, of just like appreciating all the things that are happening around you uh, at any given moment. And I feel like, you know, some of the work you've done in the past or the work that you're doing now, um, you know, it speaks to that. It captures that. Particularly, I know right now your passion and your focus is Mojo, and it seems like that's 
a really great way to approach this cultural obsession with sports and, and the trajectory of athletes. And so um, I want to talk about a lot of things, but why don't we, why don't we start off there since that's where your head is at? I'm assuming the most, like, I know this is the idea you had for a while, you had the pit, you know, years ago, instead of me trying to explain everything, can you give us, you know, a, a high level breakdown of what Mojo is, what it's about and how you ultimately got to this point? Sure, absolutely. Um, like you said, this has been something we've been thinking about for over 20 years. But um, the basic idea for Mojo is it's a, it's a sports stock market where the everyday fan can invest in athletes like stocks. So we like to say it's, you know, where Robin Hood meets DraftKings or Coinbase meets DraftKings. But instead of investing in Amazon or Google or crypto, you're, you're investing in athletes and people that you know and you can watch on uh, tonight on television. And so like every day is an earnings report. And so if you know your sports, and I'm a huge sports fan, if you know your sports and feel like you can predict which players are going to be great on the field, you will win money. Um, that's the way we've structured it. We can get into exactly you know how the mechanics work. But that's the high level um, idea. And to your point, we did something about 20 years ago uh, that was a precursor to this business. And that was called the pit, which I can tell you a little bit more about. But so this has been in the works for a long time. Well, I know the pit was similar to this, but it was about trading cards, right? Yeah. So basically the first venture that I ever did, so I've done a, a bunch of different ones with my childhood friend, uh, best friend, Mark Laurie, who, who was a co-owner of the Timberwolves and um, has done many different ventures. Oh yeah. We, we, we cover a lot of his moves. Obviously, yeah. like you said, he just bought the Timberwolves or yep. a piece of it with A-Rod. So. Exactly. So. He and I grew up together, Mark, in, in New Jersey. Um, I've known him since I was 10 years old, and we've been best friends ever since, 40 years now. Um, and so the first business we ever did together was called The Pit, and it was in the late 90s. And I was, but back then, you know, huge sports fans too. We thought this would be a great idea if, you know, everyday sports fan could use his or her sports knowledge and pick athletes and trade them like stocks and have the prices go up when they play on the field and beat expectations. And so this was our idea with another childhood friend too, our other best friend, Lax Chandra. So we're in our twenties and we thought, um, you know, this would be, this would be great. But our, when we went to our lawyers, they said, if this is super successful, and of course, you know, we wanted it to be super successful, that there wasn't any regulatory framework in place necessarily to govern it. And it could be construed of as illegal gambling because there was no sports wagering that was legal online. And so, you know, we decided then, you know, we don't want to take that risk. And so to do the next best thing, we thought, and to create, as you said, a sports card stock market. So we would use the trading card, the rookie cards of players as proxies for the athlete. And so um, that's what it was. And so you were, and, and, and the same thing would happen though, which is if you bought, you know, the rookie card, for example, at the time of um, Dante Culpepper or Donovan McNabb, and those were the hot players at the time. Um, uh, his performance, you know, you'd see it on Sundays, could go up 15, 20%, 10%, 25% as he played. And you didn't have to take delivery of the cards or anything like that. You could just kind of leave them in your account. We had a ticker. We had a market-making operation. And it was super, super successful. And we sold it to the Topps company, actually, in 2001. So I was about to ask when, uh, how long into running it. Like, So when did it start? Because it seems like that's around the time it started. Like, what was it in operation for a couple of years before you sold yeah. it to Tops? Yeah, we started, I believe, in 99. You know, we kind of started working on it in 98, late 98. I think we started um, 99 building it and stuff. And we launched it in 2000, my recollection. And, uh, you know, there's a big year, obviously, 2001 was 9-11 and the market crashed, and, you know, the dot-com bubble and stuff. But we still had, you know, we were one of the more successful companies back then. So I think we operated it for about a year, like the actual market, before we sold it to Tops, and um, and then we worked at Tops um, after selling it. And they had their own uh, venture called Etops, so there there was a lot of synergies between the two, and um, and then and then we worked there for a few years, and then we did Diapers.com. But we learned that space quite well. We learned how the collectibles work and. And again, we can talk about this a little bit later, the, the similarities between collectibles and NFTs and kind of how we're trying to do this market. But yeah, there was, uh, but over the last 20 years, you know, we've always been thinking this idea is still the holy grail. The sports stock market, if you do it right, you don't want to really do it with collectibles or trading cards, actually. 
now that there's this new framework in place that the online wagering being legal in, in states and, and every state you know seemingly um, coming up with its own rules to allow to allow its its customers or its residents to to bet, um, we feel like we can do it in in the right way. Yeah, it's crazy because obviously people have loved sports for literal centuries, um, but we are hitting some type of inflection point, like between a hundred billion dollars in media rights deals with the NFL or sports betting being legal in the majority of states in America. Uh, there's a lot of momentum, so I could really understand why you decided to revisit this concept. But but was selling the pit your first big exit? Yes, that was my that was my first company um, as an entrepreneur, and that was that was the first exit we had as well. So, yep, back in two thousand one, that's that's kind of where uh, where it started. And now you have fanatics buying tops. Fanatics did buy tops. What's interesting, and you know, what's funny is the CEO of the, of tops at the time when we sold it. His name is Scott Silverstein. He was my boss. We have brought him on actually at Mojo as our chief business officer and legal, uh, legal officer. So he is now here and in some funny way, I'm his boss. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's just kind of comical. So, so the world definitely comes, comes round and round. Well, that's a good opportunity to talk about with someone with like the extensive experience that you have. Um, I love the numbers. I love kind of getting into the nuances of the companies, but big picture, what have you learned in these past couple of decades? Like that's a, such a full circle situation to have the former top CEO and you sold it. Now you're working with them again. Like what, what's your perspective on just relationships and, and how, if someone wants to look at the work you've done and aspire toward a similar success, yeah, great ideas, working hard, but, but what are some other things that you're just like, well, also be mindful of this. This is how the game works. Yeah, I think, you know, again, we, we can go back to Mark a little bit. Um, I feel like he's recently summarized, uh, you know, the keys to success for an entrepreneur um, in, in three ways. You know, he talks about uh, what he calls VCP, which is vision capital people. And over the last 20 years, you kind of, at least I see that too, which is you kind of need all three of those things. You need to set up a vision about what you want your company to stand for, you know, where you want that company to be, a big North Star that is inspiring and, and um, you know, motivates you personally as the entrepreneur or as the founder. You need to be able to raise capital at some level of capital. Sometimes you can bootstrap, of course, but, you know, to really usually accelerate growth, you're going to need to be able to raise capital. Um, and then finally, the most important thing in here is, is usually the people, the P part of the VCP. And that P part, that people is kind of the engine. You know, usually you need to have that vision to inspire them to jump, to come on board with you and go on this journey. And if you can attract and retain the best people, and you've got a big, grand, inspiring vision, that usually allows you actually to raise the capital. And then if you've got all three of those, the VCP, the vision capital and people, you're, you're, you know, you're on a good track there to be successful. And then ultimately you're going to need luck. You can have all of that, but the ball's got to bounce your way, you know? Um, and so you always need a little bit of that too. And if you can actually have all four, you know, the VCP plus a little bit of luck here and there that kind of goes your way. Um, I think, I think your chances can be pretty good. And you know what they say, you make your own luck. You, know, you, you do. Put, you do. You put yourself in the like. I think that luck, in its purest sense, is still by chance. It's still luck, but like, you can put yourself in a position to receive it by doing all the other things that you're supposed to do. No, I agree exactly. You can you can improve your chances and 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 set up a possibility. You know, the more chances you have, the more shots on goal you can take. Um, the ball should break your way. The ball should bounce your way. You know, when you need it. So I do agree with that. Um, that you can kind of make your luck and stuff, but you still need it somehow. And I'm always grateful. I feel like, I still feel like I've been a little bit lucky, you know, on occasion. And, um, and you know, I, I'm thankful for that. So how does this VCP approach um, impact something like raising capital for Mojo? Like I know you all had a $75 million series A in May. 
you got Thrive Capital led that round, Tiger Globals involved these big institutional investors. Then you raise a, another $25 million, right? That's what Fin Capital and yes. the NFL Players Association invested. Uh, so mm -hmm. what does that mean to you to get the support from these type of investors? And ultimately, how were you able to sell them on the idea and get them to, to really back you so enthusiastically? Yeah, no, I think um, I'm very, very grateful that we have those investors. These are some of the best investors in the world. Thrive Capital, like you mentioned, Tiger. We also have Courtside Ventures. We've got some great angels. Gary V, Mike, uh, Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez are also involved. There's a host of other folks that, that, uh, that, have, that we've taken capital from and, and that are our partners. And I think, you know, one of the reasons we were able to secure that, it goes back to this, this, this concept of, I think we've got a huge idea here, which I'd love to get into a little bit in this interview about what Mojo is and how we can change sports culture. And it's a huge vision. Um, I think it's never been tried before, but if we get it right, I think it will be, you know, a defining company um, of this generation. So we have that, that big, big vision. And uh, it's a it's an incredible space that we're operating in. It's a growing space. The you know as the states come online, you know you can see this being one of the fastest growing um, consumer segments in the country. And then I think you know if you talk to them, the last reason or maybe the most important reason you know why they gave us capital was the team. You know not just me, but the people that we've been we've surrounded myself. My co-founder Bart Stein, who is one of the great you know product minds in the country. He's a serial entrepreneur, super successful. I mentioned Scott Silverstein that we brought over that was the CEO of Tops. Our chief people officer, uh, Diane, um, is, an amazing, is an amazing executive. And now we've got you know, 90 people uh, of some of the best engineers, designers, content folks. So I think when the investors look at the team that we have and the vision that we have, you know, they think we can truly do something unique. And uh, that's why we got the capital. Well, let's get into that vision, like you were saying, because uh, it's a great idea. Clearly, people are responding to it in the market, but it's a crowded market because what we mentioned earlier about how sports is just rapidly ascending, even after many decades of, of growth and fandom, we've like turned this corner in the 2020s. And, you know, I think you're betting that Mojo will be a beneficiary of that. But it's a crowded market. So many ideas come out. So many, hey, athletes, stock, collectibles, NFT. And it's like, how do you not get, get lost in that? How do you show people that this is more than just another novelty that we get a press release about every other week? Yeah, well, I think people may have said that uh, there's, this has never been done before. So this idea of a sports stock market, stock market the way we're going to do it is... is um, you know, it usually, it's pretty breakthrough. You know, we've talked to folks, obviously, hundreds and thousands of folks on the streets and otherwise. And so there may be some indicators. Well, has that been done before? Has it not been done before? But when you when we kind of get into it and describe how it's going to work, um, it really is truly revolutionary. So I think part of how our strategy is to break through is to, is to create this product that's super differentiated. This ability to invest in athletes like stock where it looks like Robin Hood. It's a beautiful design and super simple to use. Um, I don't think you, anyone's ever seen anything like it. So it starts, I think, with creating differentiation in your product. And then after that, you know, obviously we're going to have to message it. And, and there's a whole bunch of cool stuff that we're doing marketing wise that I think is, is super breakthrough. But I, I, I'll just reiterate again, it starts with the product and the differentiation of the product, which we can get into a little bit. Well, no, get, sure. get into it for yeah, us. Yeah, no, great. So I think, look... When, yet, when we say sports stock market, a lot of people will, you know, be like, what is that? Has that been done before? And, and then I like to sort of talk about it, like break it down into, into its components. The first thing you have to do when you're creating a sports stock market is you got to create stock. Like you actually have to have something that's of value. So when we issue stock or when someone buys, you know, shares in LeBron James or, uh, you know, um, J Jalen Hurts or, or whatever player it is, we decided that it would be super important that that stock would have what we call intrinsic value, meaning, and the way we do that is that if you own this stock, we guarantee a pay, payout at retirement of that player based on objective statistics. So you know that if you're the owner of this 
it has value because it's guaranteed and it's based objectively, again, on statistics on the field. Having been in that collectible space 20 years ago, like I mentioned in Tops, there's a lot of things out there where they'll call it an asset that you may own, whether it's crypto or an NFT or, as I said, trading cards. But you really never know what you own because there's no intrinsic value inherent to the asset. It, it is just kind of what the public may say it is, and it always has this risk of collapsing. Like the prices may collapse or they might accelerate, but it's not necessarily based on anything that you can pinpoint. That's been the problem in trading cards. There's been all these booms and busts, obviously crypto and the NFTs. Here, the first thing is this stock has value. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, it's a, when you say stock market, it's got, what's the market piece of it? So we've got the stock that has the value. Now you want to make sure there's an actual market. And the market piece for us means that there's liquidity. Users aren't going to probably going to want to hold this stock till the retirement. Like that's the anchor that gives you the value in what you own. But just like the regular stock market, they're going to want to be able to trade instantly, like get in, in, in and out of their position, you know, as the prices are moving, or maybe you think the player's price has moved, you know, too high and you want to sell, you want to take some profits. Maybe you want to double down. So this market component, this liquidity is something that we've also spent a lot of time on that we're guaranteeing to the user. There will always be a price for the user to exit or enter their position, just like there is in the regular stock market. That means that we had to build an entire trading infrastructure. We had to hire dozens of market makers, an incredible data science operation. We have to have a lot of capital to be able to do that. So that was the second piece, the market piece, the liquidity piece of the stock market. The third thing we thought was really important was that we would have you know, regulatory oversight for the customer to protect the customer. So the customer could have trust that if they were going to deposit $10,000, dollars you know, some customers may just deposit a few hundred dollars or even $50, but there will be big customers on our platform that are putting in you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. They need to be confident that their, their money is protected, that there's adequate protection for them with reserves and, and all sorts of other customer protections. And so we had to then go to the, the division of gaming, the New Jersey division of gaming to seek a license to be regulated. And that's what we did. And we just got that approval uh, last week. And so now our customers can have that confidence that this is approved, licensed and protected. Their assets are protected. So we've got those three components, stock that has intrinsic value, a market to the liquidity where you can get in and out of the position and regulatory oversight for protection. Those three things we think are the pillars of an effective stock market that has never existed before. And we're doing it in sports where there's 150 million fans in the country who think they know, you know who's going to be great and who's not. So they can truly invest in what you know. And so that I think is, is kind of the vision of how we're going to differentiate you know, with our incredible team. And I feel like, you know, we can be super successful there. So you have this great original idea. You have all these pillars that you're confident in will lead towards success. But the question for me, just as a consumer, is how do you sell people on it? Like, how do you get people to really invest their money? Because look, NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, this is what it's been forever, seemingly. And of course, there's you can buy trading cards, you can buy NFTs, like alternative assets have exploded, but it just seems like something that some people might have a, a difficult time grasping or they're, you know, they're going to feel like, really, I can put $10,000 on Tom Brady and get paid out because he, he's the greatest football player ever. Like, what's that marketing piece? You mentioned some cool marketing. Yeah. Like how do you sell the masses on such an original concept? Because like you look at the automobile, internet, anything that's changed the world, there was skepticism at first. Mm -hmm. And this is on some level, uh, you know, an original idea that could be met with skepticism. Marketing is going to be essential. How mm -hmm. do you get that message through about the real value of this product? No, it's a, it's a great question. And um, we launched next week um, in New Jersey. So our efforts are going to be concentrated in the state that I grew up in, uh, New Jersey, the 9 million residents, the 6 million that are over 21. And so we've got a lot of different tools we're going um, to use to what you said to basically to break through and to, to, to have people um, 
try the product. One of which, which I think is going to be kind of interesting, is free shares. So we're going to be able to we're going to have a, mo, a, a Mojo Mobile blue truck roaming the country, roaming the state um, on game days and uh, at bars and all throughout um, all throughout the state of New Jersey, where we'll be giving away free shares to folks where they don't have to take any risk at all. You know, they sign up and they'll have free shares of Tom Brady or, or uh, Joe Burrow or, or, or Herbert or Mahomes in their account. And they'll be able to see how it works and without having to take any risk. So that's one thing is we have enough capital to be able to kind of seed the market and give them the experience for free. So that I think is, is super important. The other thing that I think is um, that we have that's an advantage is that it's very, there's a lot of content that we're going to be able to disseminate. So you, before you even try it, you'll be able to see who the biggest movers are, you know, who the most active, and it'll be very intuitive because you'll, for example, last Sunday, you know, opening day, the players that were up five, 10% are the ones that did really well. You'd see, oh, if I had invested in AJ Brown, for example, the wide receiver of the Philadelphia Eagles in his first game, he was up almost 10%. And so that'll be disseminated. We'll have hosts and content on all the social platforms talking about it. And so that'll just be, you know, in a super engaging, fun way. You'll be able to see this before, again, having to, you know, kind of wonder what's going to happen. You'll, the results will be right in front of your eyes. And, and you and can create some FOMO with that. Like if I just see, wow, I could have made a few hundred bucks, a few thousand bucks, then it starts to be like, I'm not going to lie, like I rushed to crypto kind of late to the party once I realized that. And now, of course, we're in a whole different situation. But so many people, you know, rushed in. I don't even like I'm like Dogecoin. What the heck is that? But but that's a great example of like how everyone can just flock to something when they realize there's an opportunity. And so you think you'll be able to create something like that with this market and show millions of people like this is real. Yes, I think the key, key thing, uh, back to the value proposition, is that it's allowing customers for the first time ever to invest in what they know, meaning sports fans. Because the way we've set it up, you know, with the intrinsic value and the guaranteed payment that's based on the stats on the field, it means that if you picked it right, like if you pick that player right, you will make money. We've set the system up that way. Unlike, for example, in the regular stock market or in crypto, that's not necessarily true because you could pick the right company, even in the stock market. You could pick the earnings. It's like, I knew it. This company was going to have great earnings. This company was going to have great revenue. Get it all right, and the price could still go down because of all these <laughs> external factors. That's not Dude, the way we set it's this It's crazy up. when you see like a, a great earnings report and then the stock drops. <laughs> you yeah, know? exactly. That's but you're, just, if someone has a great game, it's going up objectively. That's the key because, as I said, the very first pillar was to have that intrinsic value so that if you own the shares of this player, you are guaranteed the payment payout based on this formula of statistics. And there's simple stats. It's like six stats. So, so there's no way around that thing. That's an immutable thing. And I feel like that doesn't even exist in the regular stock market. So I, you know, this idea is, again, it does, you know, you have to know your sports and like you have to get it right. And so if you're if you don't pick the players right, you're not going to make money. This isn't some sort of risk-free thing. There's definitely right. risks here, and that's why we're regulated. But I think the magic is that, um, is that again, it's that, it's that invest in what you know. You can, if the player has a great earnings report and you knew it in advance, uh, you will make money um, and vice versa. So I think that is, is, I don't think I've ever seen that before, and I actually feel like that dimension would be, uh, would be great if it was in other markets too, including in the regular stock market. Um, and so, uh, you know, I just think that's a big, a big advantage that we have. So you're starting out only in New Jersey and you're also only doing football. What's the plan to expand to other states? Uh, I believe you have like some licenses already, but you need full approval. But what does that look like from a state expansion and a sport expansion standpoint? Yeah, that's the right question. Sports and states. Um, we will definitely be launching, uh, you know, uh, additional sports. I mean, the, the grand vision is for Mojo to carry every athlete in every sport in the country. And then even outside the country, there's sports, you know, soccer and cricket. So I think it would be great if, you know, you typed in any player on there and that player was, was in the market and there was a price 
that reflected, you know, what the market believed about that player, that player's career. And, um, and so that's a huge initiative for us. And we'll be rolling those out, you know, methodically, you know, as we, as we move over the next several months. The, and then to your point, we also want to be rolling out additional states methodically. New Jersey is our, we're laser focused on that over the next several weeks. We have to get it right. As I mentioned, we're going to blitz that state. We're going to be giving away free shares in that state. We're going to be adding functionality. We're going to be having tremendous customer service so that hopefully we surprise and delight these customers. So our, we have like these two things going on. There's the grand vision of, of expansion, but then there's the very important part of just sheer execution in the near term to make sure that you're getting your product right and you're getting that love factor from the customer. So that's, that's how we think about it. Yeah. Create some anticipation for when you go to other states. Yep. So you have, as we mentioned earlier, you have some, some great backers, great investors. Um, I'd love to talk about a rod specifically a little bit, just because look, he's a, he's an iconic athlete. Yeah. A lot of people love him and he's really, I think one of the best examples of like a post playing career in terms of investments, in terms of how he's operating his businesses. Um, what's it like being in business with him? Anything that, that stands out that just like you learn from him or like a good story that you remember about like what it's like to be partners with this guy? I love Alex. Alex, um, Alex has been great. Um, he's a really smart, very, very substantive entrepreneur. You know, I, I, I'm a huge Yankees fan. So I know him um, as a fan, you know, growing up in 2009, he was, uh, he carried us to that World Series. So, you know, I was nervous and excited to meet him for the first time a couple of years ago when Mark introduced us. But what I was struck by most was just how smart and thoughtful and intelligent he was business-wise, you know, asking the right questions and really getting into the, um, and, and him being so curious about how the model would work and, some of the questions you're asking, you know, the marketing questions and, and just the essence of, 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 of business, you know? And so he's really passionate and smart and thoughtful. And um, not that I was surprised at that at all. You know, it makes sense that the same dedication and commitment he showed on the field that he's showing now in his second career off the field, you see it as an announcer too. He's just prepared. He works hard and he wants to win. You know, and I think those are probably the same ingredients as to why he was such a successful baseball player. And I think why he's having a lot of success as an entrepreneur. So my experience with him has been really fantastic. And it's, it's not a surprise, you know, because I know Mark so well and Mark and Alex are such close business partners. So, you know, I, I trust Mark and his judgment there. So I'm, I'm not surprised in some ways, but at the same time, you know, it's, 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 it is surprising to find someone in the second field that's, you know, having so much success in the same way that he was having on the field. Right. And so a rod is not involved in day-to-day -day operations. You know, he has a stake in the Timberwolves and right. I think for, for people who are curious about, you know, how this world works, what does an Alex Rodriguez bring to the table as an investor, even though, you know, he's not going to be in the office every day. What, what do you ultimately and your staff, just get out of his involvement? Is it really just backing an investment or, you know, is there just certain things about the vision that he can help define and evolve? Yeah, no, it's a good, it's a, it's a good question. He is not, Mark and him, Mark and Alex are not involved in the day-to-day. -day. Um, they're co-founders, but, but certainly Bart and I run the day-to-day -day operations. But Alex brings a lot, you know, um, in terms of initially, obviously he's got, he's so well-connected you know, opening doors to people, investors that we got on board, um, partners that we've wanted to do business with. And so he, he, you know, he knows everyone and, um, and can make those introductions and he has for us. Um, sorry, one second, my microphone came off a second. Um, but uh, otherwise, I think he really, just like our other co-founders, when, if you know, we're talking strategy, especially at the very beginning, you know, about how we would construct this thing and how it would work. He, he just brings um, thoughtfulness and he's got really good instincts, I think, for what customers would like. And, and obviously he knows sports really well, like he really, really knows it. And 
that's like the DNA of our business. So we have questions about like, you know, what kind of statistics should we use or, or, um, or other kinds of things, you know, his insight, I think was, was very valuable there. Um, you know, when we were kind of forming the idea and how we would put it together. So I would say, you know, all kinds of, of ways, um, is, is how we've kind of used him and, and, uh, and, and really been able to, to have, you know, a lot of benefits from his participation. Yeah. Good guy to be in business with. Well, on that note about working with, you know, iconic figures like, like Alex, uh, whether it's sports or otherwise, you have such, uh, you know, an illustrious career, any other people who you've come across, whether it's doing work with, or maybe you just ran into in a social setting where something about what they told you or the experience that you had sticks with you and possibly even informs your approach or your outlook on, on life and business. I've been lucky to have uh, so many people that have influenced me and given me words of wisdom, or I've just been able to kind of learn from, from them in action. Um, I've mentioned Mark, obviously, um, being in so many ventures with him, learning from him. I also did a business with my brother, uh, Preet, who was the uh, Preet Bharara, the uh, former U.S. attorney here in the Southern District of New York. That was an incredible experience. We created something called Cafe, which was a podcast company um, in the law and politics. And, uh, you know, he was my co-founder there. And uh, we sold that to Vox uh, last year, but um, learned so much. Obviously, I've learned from him as being his brother, but I learned, you know, working with him day to day, just kind of, again, the excellence of, of why, you know, some of the reasons why he's so successful. Um, you know, I, I think I mentioned to you, uh, Scott Silverstein, who's now our um, chief business officer, learned so much from him when he was the CEO at Topps. Um, the, C, the, the, the actual and the former CEO of Topps, meaning prior to Scott, was a guy named Arthur Shoren, one of the real iconic guys in the trading card business, learned a lot from him. And all these different little things, and each person brings their own you know, wisdom, and they're, and they're all different. But combined, hopefully it's been able to shape you know, some of my opinions and, and kind of how I go about things. Love to hear that. Definitely who you surround yourself with is, is super important. So you mentioned uh, the sale with your company that you started with your brother, Cafe. I believe you also have like Quincy, is it, on your, on your resume? Um, I think super famously diapers.com, you have had some big exits some big companies like you are a pro at this. Like, I, I, you know, I, I know, I think you're a humble guy and everything, but just looking from the outside in, someone looks at your portfolio, they look at your resume from the past couple of decades and, it, and it's really impressive. Um, what is it like selling a company for, you know, a really impressive exit, uh, you know, a, lu a lucrative payout. Um, and for people who are just aspiring to do some of the things that you're doing, like, what what should they keep in mind? And, and how does it really work when you work with, you know, the biggest companies in the world, and they have an interest in your product, and then you get to profit off of it? Like, what is that really like being in that seat? It's exciting, you know, and thank you for that. Um, it's, 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 you know, when you're in it, and you know, I look back on it, um, when you're, for example, doing diapers.com or the pit or cafe or some spider, you know, these companies that you sell ultimately, you, you don't, at least for me, you don't really think about that when you're in the business, when you're in the business as an entrepreneur and as a founder, what my experience has been is you're consistently confronted with challenges. <laughs> you're consistently on the brink, sometimes of just elimination and extinction. Like it is, you know, it is every one of these companies for everybody, not just myself is a miracle because a lot of things have to go right every day. There's just so many things um, that you have to overcome. And so you can never really think about, or at least let yourself thinking, think about, um, you know, the ultimate exit or something. You can just methodically, I think, start again, like as I started, you know, as I started this conversation with, with like your vision, you know, making sure you have great people, making sure you have access to capital. And then you're just kind of playing every day and you're executing and, and you're, and really the, what I think about, it, it's like just all the challenges, like you had to overcome that and you had to overcome this and you had to overcome this. 
And if you can, and it's very methodical, you know, and, and slowly but surely, you know, you're building, you're building and you're building and you're getting a better team and you're getting customers. And as long as you're delighting those customers and making sure that those customers are super happy, then those customers, you know, stay with you and then they tell other customers. And if you can kind of just kind of keep yourself grounded, I feel like, um, and with the execution, provided you have that vision and you've got a great team and you're in a good space, like you kind of have everything set up well, uh, good things, you know, again, you need a little bit of that luck. And then I think, you know, for me, it's just been one of these things where at the right time, then I've been, I've been lucky to kind of be able to have those exits, but they are the result of just everything that I mentioned. And it's, and, it, and you never kind of think about it, you know, when you're in it. And then when it happens, you know, you do celebrate. And I remember, I remember those moments. Um, and you, and there's, you know, there's tears and, and there's a lot of just, it's, uh, it's, I, it's very emotional. Um, but, but then, you know, you just kind of, for me, I've just moved on to the next thing pretty quickly and haven't kind of tried to harp on that. And maybe, you know, 20, 30 years from now, you can kind of look back on it and take glee in it all. But I just, I really, you know, you're usually kind of on to the next thing. Well, that's funny because I was going to ask, we we talked about what you do when you're in it. And then I understand there's some level of celebration and emotion. Um, but it's also, you have the privilege of success. You have the privilege of, you know, having an income that then allows you to maybe realize some dreams or do some cool things that you've always wanted to do. And like um, that early 2000s, starting to have some success, starting to be able to, you know, have your companies acquired anything fun that you feel like, okay, yeah, when this happened, I went and did this. I went and bought this. I went and traveled here. Just like anything that sticks with you from, uh, you know, those days of, of getting started and then having that success. <laughs> um, I mean, I, you know, after we sold Amazon, we worked there for a couple of years, but I remember when I left Amazon with Mark in 2013, I did take a big trip with my kids and we went away for like three and a half weeks or something like that to um, Asia. And we went, you know, to Singapore and, and uh, Indonesia and Barcelona prior to that on the way there. So I kind of remember that one trip as being um, sort of in between my exiting Amazon and my starting my media companies. And, and I felt like I didn't have any worries at the time because there was usually, you know, you're, you're in some kind of thing and there's always, as I mentioned, there's always some crazy thing going on with your company. So that was the one time that I can remember. And it was only for like three months where, where um, I was actually in between the two ventures where I, I, I didn't have that, but that's really the only thing I can, only time I can kind of remember where it was just, um, cause even, you know, even when we sold diapers.com to Amazon, you know, right away, we were part of Amazon and we were running diapers still, diapers.com, Quitsy, like all the collection of those brands. And so right away, you know, we wanted to impress and succeed and do right by Amazon. And I felt like I was working just as hard after selling it than prior to selling it. It wasn't like there was some break or something, you know, there was a celebration about the exit and, but then it was just right back to work. And, um, and then, you know, when I was, after I sold my two media companies, I started Mojo right away. Like, I mean, two days later, I was on the, I was here at Mojo after selling um, some spider to Bustle Digital Group at the end. I think that I closed that deal on August 31st and September 1st, I was here full time as, as the CEO. So it really wasn't a lot of time in between. Well, well maybe that's why you keep on having these wins because you just stick to it, keep your head down, do the work. What are, what are some things that, you know, in your life just interest you passions that you have hobbies that you have because obviously you know we're working hard out here but you have some interests or some things that inspire you i would imagine outside of your businesses and they probably even like help you keep your mind right and and be able to say hey i went played this sport or you know i'm a music person or what have you like what do you like to do outside of your businesses that just kind of keeps you as a well-rounded person yeah so I'm a huge sports fan, you know, and I know that might seem like it, um, you know, very consistent with Mojo, but I truly, you know, since I was seven years old, have loved sports, playing sports. Um, unfortunately, now I'm old and I can't play a whole lot, but I love watching it. 
I love going to the games. I like all the sports. I'm especially interested in baseball and football. And it's just, it's my release. Like it's my, I can sit home and watch those games. And I feel like as an entrepreneur, I very much look forward to that, you know, just being an observant. And, and um, that's, that's probably my biggest sort of source or recreation source. Um, and then, you know, my family, like I have two great kids and my wife, you know, we, we spend a lot of time together. And my kids are now 15 and 17. And so every time I, you know, if I get a moment or something, it's usually with them. And uh, I've just taken a lot of pleasure and pride and, and happiness in being a dad for them and spending a lot of time with them. Um, I would say that's kind of what kind of strikes me most if I think about the last 17 years, my daughter's 17. <laughs> And it's like, you know, it's been like, I'm, in, I'm at work, I'm doing these businesses. And then it's just like them, you know, the kids and, and spending time with my family. Is your 15 year old son or daughter? My 17 year old's my daughter. She's a mm -hmm. senior in high school. And my 15 year old is my son. Well, I just, I can relate to you. I have an older daughter, younger son with the same age gap, but oh, it's okay. like, like six and three and a half, but right. um, I'm at the beginning of this journey. Like I, I'm where you were like a decade ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when it yeah, comes yeah. to the dad life, uh, but it's Good. fun. I feel I feel the same way about it. I was just talking to my wife this morning. It's like that's that's a lot of the enrichment in my life, and exactly. and it, and it actually helps me with business because when I can go take a weekend and we go to soccer, or, you know, she just started theater, um, stuff like that. It really keeps you well rounded. But while we're talking, that's family. Your friendship with Mark, Laurie, is is so influential. Your business partners, you've known him since you're 10 years old. You both have built companies together, sold companies together, had all this success. Um, what is it like to look at that guy <laughs> across the table and say, dude, we did it. We, we were friends and we were hanging out, probably riding bikes through the neighborhoods of New Jersey's decades ago and, and look at us now. I mean, he sold jet.com to Walmart for billions. Like, you know, how, how does that affect uh, a friendship in, in, in a good way, but just like what happens ultimately? Do you, do you just keep going and say, dude, yeah, we were meant for this. Or, you know, do you have moments where it feels surreal? Like it's a great story. It's a great friendship. And I'm wondering how all these successes impact that. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's funny because I, you know, we're just talking about family and I think of Mark as family, um, really, like as another brother. And I've just known him so long. And so despite all of his incredible achievements, you know, when I'm hanging out with him or he's texting me or I'm at, you know, his apartment or he's at mine or, you know, we're just kind of like old, old friends. Right. And um, we have so many stories that we can think about, whether it's in high school or when we studied abroad, you know, um, that it doesn't feel like I'm not surprised because he's such a talented guy for all of his achievements. But when we're hanging out and when we're spending time together, it's really, it's really just like as friends, you know, we're getting sushi together or we're having a meal and we're talking about our families or we're talking about sports or we're talking about weird, you know, mundane things or telling jokes, you know, and it's just like you and your friends. There's no difference. You know, obviously we lead similar lives in terms of our business ventures and how we think about that. So there's, there's, there's a lot of advice I can get um, from him, you know, um, but most of it is really just trying to enjoy regular friendship, you know, and there's so much trust I think that we both have for each other and he makes me laugh. I hope that I make him laugh. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's really that, you know, but just like kind of like pu the purity of it, the purity of friendship. Right. Kind of that, pro that probably that probably helps the business relationship too because you know it's not just work 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 you know i'm sure you all work a lot but you, you're brothers and yeah. you know that takes it to another level well to put a bow on all of this and you know we've heard so much about mojo so much about your story you know various wins that you've had over your career and I even feel like, you know, we, we adequately talked about, uh, you know, your perspective, your, your, your vision, capital people, like what is the craziest thing you've seen though? Like what's, what's, what's the thing that you just feel like 
wow. Like, I, cause it, it seems like you're just, you're in this position, you know what you got to do. Yeah. You've celebrated and stuff, but you put your head down and, and do the work. But look, like I said, you have a, a great resume. Is there anything that's just kind of like stopped you in your tracks and you're just like, okay, I, I like to keep it chill and do the work, but, but this is unbelievable. You mean, you mean like a moment or an experience or something like that? Yeah. I mean, you know, every once in a while I will just kind of like, for example, even in Mojo, you know, when I'm sitting there with Mark and, uh, you know, Alex Rodriguez comes in and we meet and then Alex Rodriguez, you know, brings in, you know, David Cohn or we're on a call with Pat Mahomes or whatever it is, you know, every once in a while I'll, I'll, I'll pinch myself and think like, that's been, you know, I'm again, back to being lucky. I'm talking, you know, to Pat Mahomes right now, you know, like he's on a zoom or I'm talking to David Cohn, you know, who was an idol of mine growing up um, as a Yankee fan. And even just Alex, you know, Alex, Alex Rodriguez, because again, you know, 2009, like he carried us to that world series. And it's just, I'm, I'm texting Alex, you know, um, it's pretty cool. You know, I think not like so all the time doing that, but every once in a while I'll pinch myself and, and think uh, I've been, again, back to being just super lucky. Well, what do you want to leave us with in terms of, you know, what we can expect from Mojo? I know we talked about the launch with New Jersey, but, you know, you're probably thinking well beyond next month. Uh, in some ways, you have to execute on what's right in front of you. But, you know, vision can be five years, 10 years, like, you know, what, what do you want to leave us with in terms of where you think this is going, what we should keep in mind once uh, all that marketing starts to hit and just ultimately like, you know, what impact do you want to have on the sports world and the world at large? Yeah. I mean, we, our mission is to entertain and bring more fun into the world. And so we don't want to take ourselves too seriously. You know, um, we're not bringing world peace um, to, to the world, but, but, you know, I think it's important that we, make a contribution, you know, in terms of fun and entertainment. And when we think about that, we want to do it in a grand way. And our view is that there's never been anything like this before. And if you fast forward, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, in every sports debate conversation you're having, Mojo should be referenced because there's going to be a price. And that price is going to reflect what the public thinks about a player and what the public thinks about that player's career. And it can be when you turn on a game and watching it, there should be the Mojo Price on the bottom showing where he's at, where he's being, and what the public thinks where he's going. And so we just, in a grand way, we feel like if we can be in sports culture, part of the conversation, that would be great. And not just in New Jersey, like, like, and not just in football, but every sport, every state, not just America, all around the world, Mojo should be, you know, the Mojo market should be kind of front and center, but always in a fun and entertaining way. And, uh, and yeah, so to me, that's what we're striving for. I think we're going to, I think we have a good shot of pulling that off. All right. Well, Vinny, thank you for joining us and wishing you the best of luck, but I also feel like you already have a lot of that. So yeah, no, <laughs> you I know, agree. yeah, no, uh, I love, I love talking to people uh, such as yourself and, and just understanding a bit more about, you know, how this world works and, and where your vision and where your dreams can take you. So uh, thanks a lot for keeping it super real with us and appreciate you coming on. Thank you. It's really great. My pleasure. That's a wrap on another episode of My Other Passion. I want to thank Vinny for coming out and giving us all that game on what it takes to be an entrepreneur and successful in business. If anybody knows, it's certainly him. I'll definitely be keeping an eye out for what he's doing with Mojo. And I got to say, we've been getting some heavy hitters. It's been a lot of fun so far. Appreciate the support, whether you've been listening from the beginning or this is your first time tuning in. We have a lot more on the way. We'll be back next Wednesday with another awesome guest, as always. Until then, I'm out.